Welcome to the Rochester Oral History Archive tutorial, Exploring Oral History Projects in the College Classroom. Oral historian Donald Ritchie says oral history is too dynamic and creative a field to be entirely captured by any single definition. For every rule, an exception has worked. Imaginative interviewers are constantly developing and sharing new methods and uses of oral history. Any definition of the oral history process or any method of interviewing must reflect the goals of the specific project. Just like journalists have their own methodology, so do oral historians. The Oral History Association publishes best practices and procedures that are posted to this website. Journalists and other researchers might focus on objective reporting without any contextual analysis. Oral historians seek to place the narrative in a context that gives it a wider significance. Oral historians value the relationship between the parties involved in an interview. There's even debate about the best terms to use to describe the roles. Some find the term interviewee too passive and offer respondent or narrator as more active alternatives. Oral historians should seek to increase their awareness of the power dynamic inherent to the relationship between the subject and the researcher. The Oral History Association promotes the view that an oral history is a joint product that develops as a result of all participating parties. Start researching oral history projects in your own town and state. You'll find projects both large and small connected to everything from small historical societies to large universities to the federal government. One of the best known oral history projects was conducted by the WPA, Works Projects Administration, in the 1930s. And today you can find ongoing oral history projects administered by the Smithsonian, NASA, and the National Park Service. The largest and oldest oral history program in the world is the Columbia University Oral History Research Office. Local projects in the metro area include John Novak Digital Interview Project at Mary Grove College, the Southwest Detroit Latino Oral History Project, and the Rochester Oral History Archive. At this point, I encourage you to listen to oral history excerpts available on the StoryCorps website. You can stop this slideshow and visit www.storycorps.org listen to choose an excerpt that interests you. The StoryCorps website also features animations, including some with Studs Terkel, of oral history excerpts. These are great resources to share in class. At this point, I encourage you to listen to oral history excerpts available on the StoryCorps website. You can stop this slideshow and you can visit www.storycorps.org listen to choose an excerpt that interests you. You can also watch animations, including some with st featuring Studs Terkel. These are great resources to share in class. The StoryCorps website features a great questions list that includes questions for family, coworkers, and many specific situations. These questions can be a guideline to getting started. Stress the importance of using open-ended questions and practice strategies for follow-up questions. One grandmother, when asked who had been kind to her in her life, responded, Many people have been kind to me. I don't want to single anybody out. Brainstorm strategies for getting past roadblocks like that. Also, discuss the ethics of shared authority discussed earlier. Interviewers cannot pressure subjects to discuss issues they don't want to discuss. It's time for a brainstorm. Pause the slideshow at this point and give yourself 20 minutes to brainstorm a potential subject for an oral history. Focus on family, friends, and accessible people that you really could interview in real life. A hypothetical interview is a great practice technique. Imagining not only the questions, but hypothetical answers to those questions gives us the opportunity to experiment while remaining in control of the situation. In this exercise, I encourage students to compose a written record of the hypothetical interview or use a digital storytelling tool to create an animation or voice recording to represent the hypothetical interview. A fishbowl interview is a tried and true method of mastering oral history methodology. In this exercise, two students or an instructor and another volunteer can conduct an oral history on a topic of interest in front of the entire class. After the interview, students can critique the process and offer suggestions for improvements, incorporating those lessons into their own future interviews. Preparing for an oral history with a person in the wider community requires preparation. This series of steps is a good start, since oral history is distinguished from general interview by the historian's intention to preserve and share the material, it's important to locate a repository 
for an oral history assignment. Students can often find a local historical society, library, or museum that will accept recordings. StoryCorps and the Library of Congress also accept recordings. Guidelines covered here are adapted from the Oral History Association Best Practices. A link will be provided at the end of this unit. Coming up with questions can be tricky, but it's important to be prepared. Based on the goals of the project, determine whether a chronological or a topical approach is better suited. Biographical interviews are usually chronological. If the project focuses on an event, then choose a topical structure. Mix open-ended and specific questions, but mostly begin with open-ended questions. Stress the importance of a pre-interview meeting. Students should not meet the interview subject for the first time when the interview is being recorded. Spend time with the subject and outline the scope of the interview before meeting to record. Preserving the integrity of a recording requires that you take a systematic approach. If using a digital voice recorder, get new batteries every single time. With a laptop, bring a power cord and extension. Place equipment in a visible location and be aware of and eliminate any unwanted noise. Oral histories can be rendered useless by the sound of wind, air conditioning, pets, or the presence of food and drink. Always do a sound check. Remember that an oral history is a partnership between both parties involved in the interview. Donald Ritchie reminds us, you cannot simply walk out the door with someone's life story, their candid reflections, and sometimes extremely personal observations. Interviews can be difficult, emotional experiences, and sometimes you need to spend some time to talk with the interviewee after the interview without the recorder running. There are so many ways to extend oral history projects using new media in the classroom. I'm ending with two short videos created with excerpts of ROHA project interviews. There are many student and professional oral history projects doing work like this, and I've included links in the resource section of this website. Think creatively. I hope you'll have a great experience exploring the possibilities of oral history in your classroom. Please feel free to contact the ROHA project and share your work. We would love to feature it on our website. What's the difference between just something passing and entertaining and something that really sinks deep in you and means something to you and maybe even changes how you see the world? Because uh, literature could do that for people. I believe in art very deeply, all kinds of art, and I was lucky to be in an artistic profession for so many years. So that's the biggest legacy. You know, the, the fun that they had is always a good thing. The sense of quality that they hopefully got from what we did will always be with them. I think the, the, those are probably the two biggest things. I think to some extent the legacy of the store in terms of educating people about the problems that come when people try to censor books. Um, I think that changed a lot of people. I had customers who called me, for instance, all distraught because their kindergarten teacher had read, when the new baby comes, I'm moving out. And her saying, well, this is terrible to make children hate their new baby, and I would say, well, you know, a lot of children have sibling problems, you know, and so there's got to be some children in that class, you know, who really found that a comforting book, and you remember at the end, he ends up really feeling good about the baby, so I don't think anybody's permanently damaged, and some kids who come from different kinds of homes than your home, evidently, probably found that very comforting, and she, luckily, I had the most wonderful customers, because she said to me, you know, I never thought about that, that's really interesting. So I think that kind of learning probably has an effect, you know, on a bigger effect over time. Um, there's so many things, I just think it just, it gave a model for what you could expect in customer service, so that maybe if at some point those people start their own businesses, we'll see a little bit of that, because there's so little of that commitment to really being kind to the customer and loving the customer and enjoying the customer and thinking about the next step ahead as to what they might need. Um, so maybe that'll have an effect. I think all of the things that we did are those kind of amorphous effects. But the other one, of course, is that sitting in people's houses all over the United States are books that were bought at Halfway Down the Stairs that are very well-loved books and that hopefully will get passed on in those families so that maybe, who knows, you know, years and years from now, those books are still sitting on somebody's shelf because they've become beloved keepsakes in that family. And that, that's a very special thought the life of the store goes on that way. I think we may have been some of the only people that actually slipped into school instead of slipped out of school. We knew that there was a loose window.
<laughs> it's been replaced, so so nobody else can do with it what we did. But we were trying to get the scholastics work and the advanced placement portfolios done by the deadline, and we needed to use school on a Saturday. So yes, my students actually slipped into school willingly to complete their um, scholastics and their AP. And I think th those are the groups that will probably uh, remember me the best, um, was that energy and the community that we developed in the room. Um, there would always be, you know, a dozen or 20 kids really into art or into what we were doing, whether it was traditional studio art or later on digital art. And um, I could always count on them to try out new ideas, and they were my sounding board. So if I had to say who were my mentors, they were my muses.